promotion. And Ivan is currently a PhD student and lecturer at the School of Interactive Arts and Technology at the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. He received his Bachelor in Computer Science and Master's in Media and Technology, and both from the Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. So he has researched the areas of virtual and augmented reality, computer graphics, HEL, and virtual production. And he has worked with R&D for the VFX film industry. So he has done a lot. But his current research focuses on using interdisciplinary approaches to investigate, develop, and analyze human computer interfaces for virtual and augmented reality. And today he's going to tell us something about his research into VR locomotion. So the planning of the event will be as follows. Ivan um, will talk for around 20 or 30 minutes about VR locomotion, and then we have time for questions and answers. So I really hope you like the event and thank you, Ivan, for hosting this for us. I'm sure everybody's very excited to hear what you've got to say. So yeah, thanks everybody. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Probably. Yeah. Great. All right. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so today we will be learning about uh, how to move in VR. It's really important. Um, we do this all the time when we're in VR, but how do we actually move? What are the types of movement we have? All right, so um, as you said, thank you very much. Um, I am a PhD student and lecturer at SFU in, here in Canada in Vancouver. Uh, I'm working at the iSpace lab. Uh, and then I did, I did my undergrad and master's at, um, at some, in Brazil. And I've been studying research in this since 2010. All right, so I wanna learn a little bit more about you guys as well. Um, so how long have you been using VR for? So if you're in Modicons, um, react to what you've, how long you've been using VR. So for, one, for less than a year, between one and two years, two to five, five to 10, 10 to 20, over 20 years, All right? All right, so we have a wide range of, of users, that's great. So you, everybody's used for a lot of different, um, different amount of years, it's really great. So hopefully this will be beneficial for everybody. And what do you normally use VR for? Is that for gaming? Is it for do you research VR topics? Um, do, or you, do you use VR as a medium to do other research? Do you use it for training and simulation, education purposes, maybe a different use? All right, we also have a big mix as well. Great. Um, so we'll, everybody uses it for a lot of different re reasons. It's really good. Um, VR can be used for many different things. All right, so we normally, our living room normally isn't this large, right? So we normally can't just walk anywhere and do whatever we want in the living room. So how do we actually move in these virtual environments? So how do you move in VR when your virtual environment is larger than your physical one? So, but first we need to think about why do we need to move in VR anyway? Why is movement so important? Well, normally there are three main things you want to do while you're in VR. The first is to explore. Right, you're in this world, you don't know what it's about, maybe you want to see what's going on in this world, what, what can I find here, what's, what's all around me. And so that's all the exploration. You really want to figure out what's going on in the world. And movement is really important for that. The other one is for searching. Sometimes you want to find something, right? You want to find a specific object, you want to go to a specific location, you go from one place to another, we have to find something. It's really important you know how to you can search for objects, search for things in that virtual world. So movement is really important for that. And then we have maneuvering which is like these precise small movements. Say you're in this virtual world and there's a table in front of you and you need to inter inter interact with objects on that table. You need to then position yourself right really close to that table enough so that you can interact with things, grab things and touch. So it's really important that you have this precise small movement or else it can be really frustrating for the user. So locomotion is normally a means to an end. Normally you move so you're able to do something else. So what are the types of locomotion? Well, there are, by thinking about interactivity, there are normally two main types, which is active and passive. Active is when the user has full control over the movement, where you're, you're continuously controlling where you're going, where you're looking, your acceleration, your position. And then for passive, it's the system's controlling. Um, the system will take you to one place or the other. It will control your speed. It will control how you move in that world. So if you're on like a ride, for example, like this VR rides, Right, you have no control. The, the, the cart is taking you where it wants to go, and the track is kind of leading you in, in the speed as well. 
sometimes you're playing in a game, for example, and you have to like shoot an award of enemies. And then once you're, you're, you're past those, you're then brought to the next location. So you just is taking care of all the locomotion for you. And our, our talk was mainly on active interactivity. And, we, and there are two main types. One is called continuous, which we have um, continuous control over your position, your velocity, right? So like a joystick, for example, the more you, you push the joystick, the faster you move, and you move in the direction that you're pointing to. But it's continuous motion. You're continuously going in that direction. But then we also have discrete, which is normally a key press. You press the button, you teleport, you do something, you press another button, you move again, right? It's a series of, of pressing and stopping to press. So there are a few types we'll talk about. Um, there are many, of course, many more, but I focus on a few, which can be controller-based, walking, steering, selection, manipulation, and movement. Hopefully this will help you all to understand. So the first one is called controller-based. And two main ones that we normally always use is joystick, right? So normally you have one joystick to control moving forward, backwards, left and right, or something in between. And the more you push in that direction, maybe the faster you go. And then we also have look in teleportation. So you would uh, point to somewhere, you would then teleport to that location. You would then choose where you want to go again, kind of look around, teleport again. And then here on the right, we have dash, which is you, um, you, press forward, for example, on your joystick, and you quickly move in that direction. Sometimes there's this, uh, this tunnel effect or a vignette effect to kind of help you uh, to focus where you're going, to not cause too much cyber sickness, but you quickly move in that direction when you, when you press the, the joystick. And then here on the other side, we also have uh, keyboard and mouse, which is also sometimes used. So you, maybe you should look with your headset and then use your WASD keys to move in that direction, or you have the, the how you look in the, based on your mouse, kind of like the first person shooter. So you've probably used some form of, of locomotion today. So which one have you guys used so far? Um, is it teleportation, dash, joystick, mouse and keyboard, real world walking? So what have you guys used so far today? All right, so most of you have used teleportation, um, some dash, and mainly joystick. And I'm guessing you're probably on the Using the 2D version, you'll probably use mouse and keyboard. All right, so a lot of different types. All right, so then we'll discuss some more. The next one is walking. All right, the first one is, of course, one-to-one -one walking. The, the way you move in, in your physical world is the exact same way you're moving in virtual world. Um, so you move around, right, it's one-to-one. -one. You move your head, move your body, and you're moving the exact same way in virtual world, which is really useful because you see what you're moving, your body feels like the same way you're moving. It's really, it's very little chance of you getting sick from that. But sometimes, of course, we the real world is so large, we can't just always do one-to-one. -to -one. Then there are two other kinds called redirected walking and scaled walking. So redirected is when you want your users to go like straight, for example, in the virtual world, to go straight in a path. But you, what you actually, ask, you actually have them do is you walk, have them walk in a curved path. So they'll, they'll be actually walking in a curved way but they will imagine they're walking forward. Um, and what happens is normally in the VR world is you're normally kind of doing really small changes to, the, to the, what they're looking at. So they feel like they're walking forward, but they're just walking in a circle. And it's really useful because you can then now walk really large distances and environments just based on where you are. But one of the, side, the bad side is you kind of have to have a pretty large environment though, because you have to be large enough for people to walk around in a circle. Um, so that's one of the downfalls. And then we have scaled walking, which is you can kind of scale your world up and down and walk in that world with that scaled effect. So it's as if you're like a giant and you're walking, right? You're taking these steps. And as if you're a giant, your steps are really large. So you're walking much faster in that world. Another way of doing it is you can um, scale your walking speed. So if you were to take a step, your speed is like as if you were walking three steps at once. This is, this is pretty useful to get around, but sometimes it's difficult to do really precise movements, really small adjustments. All right, the next one is called steering. And there are a few types. One is called gaze-directed steering. It's really common, which is you use a joystick to um, move based on where you're looking at. So which is normally what you have all used today. So when you use your joystick, you're normally moving in where you're looking. So you, you press forward, for example, the forward is based on where you look. Another way of doing it is based on your torso. So you have something um, tracking where your body is, where your torso is facing. 
and you move based on that where that torso is. So what's interesting about that is you can now uh, move forward while looking to the sides. So you can look to the right, look to the left, and continuously move forward. So it's interesting for like for games, for example, right? If you want to shoot some enemies on the on the on the side, but you want to move forward, move away from them, you can. And then we have hand directed steer. And this one you use your hand to steer where you want to go. So based on where you're 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 pointing at, that's where your your movement you're moving to. So it's really intuitive, because um, all you need to do is point, and then you control the speed of a joystick or some other movement of their former button press. So it's very intuitive, very easy to use. All you have to do is just point. All right, and then there's also something called leaning based, which you can do on a chair, you can do standing, which is normally you you kind of have this initial position, this calibrated position, and based on how much you lean, that's where you're going. So think of it as being a human joystick. So you are now this joystick, and the further you lean forward, it's as if you're pushing the joystick forward. So you now move in that direction based on how, how much you lean. And the, the more you lean, the faster you go. Just like a joystick. So the interesting thing about this is you can also lean in a direction and look at a different direction at the same, the same time. And this can be done while you're seated, which you can um, track the user's headset, or you can also track the chair, uh, the chair movement as well. And then we have um, standing based which is pretty similar. You're also leaning in the direction you want to go. But for this one, their study called Navi Board, what they did is they had these, this inner circle. And in that circle, it's one-to-one -one movement. So you can do really small and precise movements. But once you step out of that circle, you're now doing a leaning base. You can now accelerate and move really fast. Um, interesting thing about this is that each different um, place you're stepping on, you, the user would feel with their feet. So with their feet, they can know if they're in the circle or out of the circle. Okay, then we have uh, vehicles, right? You can, for example, if you're riding a car, you're driving a car, you would have steering wheel, you have the gas pedal, all these things you have in your real world life. And then you would use a VR head to ride to uh, look around the world. So it's really intuitive for you. It kind of mimics what we have in the real world. And then we also have um, flying. So you have like the hot toss controllers, for example. You can then use those controllers to fly and move around the virtual world. And there's also one called um, the 3D rudder, which is for from PlayStation, which is you use your feet to point where you want to go. So your feet kind of rotating on this platform, and that's where your, your forward is facing. So you can then use your joystick to move in that direction and move based on what that forward is. So you use it, you can also, for example, with this, you can look in one direction, point your feet to the other, and go in that direction. So it's also really useful for that as well. And then we have on the other side the bicycle, right? So you're pedaling. And you can also steer sometimes. So based on how you pedal, how fast you pedal, and where you steer is where you're going. Then we have um, for flying as well. So this is called Birdly. And for this one, you can like, kind of flap your arms around. If you're flapping like a bird, and the, 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 um, the faster you flap, the faster you move. And then you can then steer with your body where you want to go. And they also added the span, so you can feel kind of the wind um, going for your against you while you move. It's really interesting. All right, the next one is called selection based. So there are a few types. So one is where you draw a path where you want to go. So you draw this path and then you would then, the system would then take you to, um, across that path, either by a, a, a constant velocity, a constant acceleration through that path you just drew, or you have these little nodes, these steps in between where it would stop, and then you can do perform some action, interact with something, and then teleport to the next one, or then move to the next one. And you can easily um, draw a new path anytime you want as well. And then we have a uh, map target, which you have like a mini world map of your, of your view. You would look at it, and you would click on it, and it would position you to a new location on that world. And then we have route planning, which is the same thing. You have like a world view of where you're going, but then you click in multiple locations in that world view, and then you would kind of teleport or you would be taken by the system um, right from some speed uh, between all those points. And the more you press, the more control you have over it. But the, the speed and how you move is normally done by, by the system. So it's a little bit of you and the system working together. Next, we have manipulation. So there's one called camera and hand. It's really, really interesting, um, which is 
the virtual camera, like your, kind of your headset view, is now in your hand, kind of in your finger. So you point to where you want to where you want to look, and that would change your view of the world based on how you point. So normally you have like this this 3D model of the world, and you just kind of point to where you want to go, and you would see that. The other one is World in Miniature, where you would also have a 3D view of your world. And what's interesting is you have two views at the same time. So you, if you look around, you have your first person view, so you can see the whole world from your viewpoint. And then in this little um, like this area in front of you, you have the whole 3D world, and you can grab yourself and just position yourself all around the world. So you can move your, your avatar in, that would change where you like teleport to. Next one is called movement simulation. And in this one, there are two, these two types are, one is arm swinging. So if you swing your arms up and down, and depending on where you're looking, you would move in that direction. The faster you swing, the faster you move. And the other one is walking in place. You normally have sensors either on your legs or you're tracking the controller, the sensor on your hip, right? Or maybe tracking the headset. And depending on where you look and the, how fast you move your legs, how fast your body kind of jumps up and down, um, that'll move you in that direction as well. It's also really interesting because your body is also feeling that you're moving um, and you're pointing based on where you look. One of the downsides though is it's hard to look at one way and move in a different way. You need to have a little bit more trackers on that. Then we have platforms, which I think a little bit interesting. So on, here on the right, we have this robotic platform that whenever you take a step, it knows kind of where you're stepping. So it, the new tile goes to it. And then this robotic platform just keeps moving kind of around you. So you're constantly kind of walking in, in, walking in the same space because all of these drag you back. What's interesting about this is the platform itself can go up and down. So you can also get a height variation. So like, like you're going up and down, like stairs up and down, like some hill. And then we have Gate Master, which is kind of like similar to like those machines you have at a gym. You're kind of just constantly, constantly walking. And you're, so you're walking in that direction, taking like all these steps. Um, and it kind of follows you as you step. And that'll make you move in that virtual world as well. One of the downsides, though, to, um, to like the robotic platform one is what if you move really quickly? It can be a little bit dangerous, right? So what it, look at this, this picture right here. Say this user wants to do a sidestep or a strafe, right? Walk to the right. The platform wasn't fast enough, the person would just fall um, on, the, on the ground. So it can be a little bit dangerous. Then we have omnidirectional treadmills. Um, so here on the right, we have one where it's all these little spheres. And you're constantly like slipping on these spheres. You're, you're stepping on them. They slide you back to the center. So as you move, as you step, you're walking in whatever direction you move. So it's really interesting because it's like real world walking, right? You can walk in any direction and you'll move in that direction. And the other one is also the virtualizer. It's interesting because um, same thing, you have a harness, you're walking in a direction, you're kind of slipping on the ground. Um, you can walk, you can, um, because you have a harness, you can also crouch and you can jump because it tracks that as well. And this one can also change the height. That's really interesting because you can walk up and downhill of things as well. Then we have one called the virtue sphere. So it kind of looks like a hamster ball. And so you're inside this gigantic sphere and you have this harness and you're walking around. And as you walk, the sphere is rotating. So it'll, it'll track how you, how you walk, the speed that you walk, and it'll make you move in that, in that virtual world with that speed in that direction. So it's really interesting because you can walk in any way, you can shoot in any way, interact in any way. It's interesting as well. But right, one of the downsides of these virtual sphere and the omnidirectional treadmill is they're very large devices. It's kind of hard to bring it to like your friend's house, right? To go to other places. Um, you just normally have it at a lab and somewhere that you're using it. All right, then we have roller shoes. So here we have the powered ones, which is whenever you take a step, what happens is these shoes have this power on it, so they would bring, they would um, roll you back. So you take a step, it knows how what distance that step was, and it rolls you back to the center. So you're constantly just walking kind of in place as well, but you're you're stretching your legs forward. So it's a little bit better than just walking in place because you have a little bit more um, control of your body, and your body really feels like you're actually moving. Um, but it, the other problem was you can't really move really fast. It's hard to move, do like side steps. So if you walk to your right, it's not an omnidirectional roller. It's, it's more back forward and backwards. So there are some issues. Then we have the cyber shoes, which is the non-powered version. So you're sitting on a chair, for example, and you move your feet. As your feet scrapes across the floor, it knows kind of um, how much it scrapes, uh, the speed it scrapes, right? And then that'll move you in that direction. 
and you would use your body like on a swivel chair to actually rotate in that world. Then there's swimming, really weird one. So this one, you're kind of um, in this harness, you're kind of being put up in the world. And then based on how you move your arms, how you move your legs, you're then swimming across that environment because there's sensors everywhere. So that sensor is interacting with physics in the world, and that'll move you across the world as if you're swimming. So there are many other ways of moving. Um, I only showed a few. There are many more. So there's this website I found a few weeks back called the Locomotion Vault on GitHub, and they have over 100 different ways of moving in VR. It's really interesting. They have it based on like research studies, based on games from all different locations, and they're constantly adding more. So it's really interesting if you want to learn a lot more real quickly. And if you're developing, for example, it's good to, um, to get inspiration on things. All right. So the question is, have you ever used an interface that wasn't controller-based or wasn't walking-based? So yes, put a heart. No, put a frown face. And unsure, put the little tongue out. All right, some of you have. Uh, most, some are unsure, and some haven't. All right, so if you haven't, I would really um, recommend if you can, try to, because it's really interesting. You never know if you like, might, like, might like a new interface or not. All right, so this leads us to the next question is, we've now learned how to move, right? There are many different kinds, but which one do you choose? There are so many options. Like I said, there's over 100 different ones. So how do you know which one you use? How do you choose one? So the first thing I would say is try to complete a task with an interface and evaluate your results. So try to do something with multiple interfaces, the same task, and how do you think about what happened? How did, how did you perform that? What happened? Were you able to do the task? Right, so say if you're in this world, can you find something in this world? Can you go, to, can you go from point A to point B? How long does it take you to get there? Like, right, we'll go over these in a little bit. So try to do a task. So here are a few metrics ways you can evaluate. There are many, many more, but I'll just touch on a few, um, which we'll do in the next, next slides. First one is usability. So how usable and how useful is your interface to accomplish the desired task? So here we, there was a study where they, you had this map and you had to find these spheres. And these spheres were kind of like, your X is where you started and the circles were where you, the spheres were. You had no clue what the environment was, and, but you had to find these things all around. So they evaluated a bunch of interfaces and, and looked at, well, what's, how fast do people get to those locations? How fast can they find the spheres? Is it, um, can they have an understanding of the environment or not? And then the other one, they had a study where they would have a bunch of um, boxes spread out in this world, and there isn't a lot of texture. So it's kind of, the, the, point, the idea is you're not really supposed to use cues of where you are. You're supposed to more use a locomotion and your understanding of the world. So they had a bunch of boxes, and some of them had spheres inside, some of them didn't. And the idea is, can you find all the spheres? So, the, so then the question is, with the interface that you have, it, are you able to do the task that you want it to do? And also, are you always use, able to use that interface? So sometimes you're working with something, like in a task, you're grabbing something with two hands. And then if your interface uses a joystick, it's, it might get a little bit complicated, right? If you're trying to perform some action with your hands, can you still move? the way you want to move. The next thing is, is there a sensory conflict based on that interface? Which means, um, do your senses have any conflict of what's going on? Do your eyes think that you're moving, but your inner ear thinks that you're not moving, right? What's, what's really going on with your body? And then once, when your senses start having conflict, that can lead to motion sickness, to cyber sickness. You can start feeling nausea and dizzy, right? That's why sometimes when you use joystick, for example, you can get sick from that because your body is stationary, you're just sitting down, but you're, you're using your joystick to move forward. Especially rotation, it's really bad as well. Rotation gets really difficult because you start rotating your view, especially like snap ones, and then your body's, well, I'm not moving, I'm just sitting here. What's going on in the world? Why am I, why, what's, why am I going forward? Why am I rotating? What's going on? So your body doesn't really understand what's happening, and that can lead to you getting sick. So depending on the interface, the one that's more natural, that feels like your body your senses are all working together, is one you normally get less sick from. Next one is affordance. Um, so when people start using your interface or they pick it up for the first time, do they need to learn a lot to be able to use it? Um, do, can they easily pick it up? Do they easily understand how to use it? Like here's the interface, 
here's whatever. Can you do it? Can you do what you're supposed to do without a lot of instructions, without a demo, without a tutorial, right? So it's really important that things are, have affordance. They, it's easy to understand. Um, so there was a study where they looked at uh, gaze base, they looked at teleportation, they looked at one-to-one -one, uh, movement, and they also compared a lot of different things. One of them was the people really understand and know how to use these interfaces. And then the other one is performance. Really important, right? Um, so once you give your user a task, how well do they perform that task? And can you compare that performance with other ones? So for example, for this one, they had users um, do a six degree of so like flying around the environment. And the task was you need to go through these tunnels. These tunnels will get smaller and smaller and they will also change in rotation. Um, so can you go through these tunnels without touching the border, without going out of it, and, and how fast can you complete this task? Um, so they, they ran through a the, the bunch of different interfaces and they found out right, some are better than others. So the, how fast you do a task, how accurate, how the least amount of errors you do, um, how many points you get. Uh, if it's like a, a shooting game, how much health do you have at the end of the level, right? These all really impact your, your performance. And the next one is fun and preference, really important. So which one do you have the most fun with, right? Because you're not gonna use an interface that may be really good at doing what you want it to do, really perform it, but you're not, you're not enjoying it. So it's really important that you prefer what interface you like and you use the one that you works best for you. So there are many other metrics you can look at. Um, you can look at, for example, can you strafe? Can you move backwards? Can you move in a circle easily while looking in a different direction? Um, is the interface portable? Uh, how accurate and precise are you? Can you? Is there a lot of cognitive physical load? Which is, does it take, is it so demanding that you need to really think about how you move, that you can't focus on the task that you have? Um, or is it very tiring, right? So maybe you're using a different specific locomotion, but you get tired really easily, you get really sore after using for a few minutes or a few hours. So this is all really important as well. So which interface should you choose? Well, like I said, first thing you should do is try to complete a task with an interface and multiple ones, and to really think about these aspects. Right? Which one was better for you to complete the task? Which one do you feel less sick with? Which one do you perform better? Which one was easier to use? Which one did you really enjoy and prefer? So in summary, we've learned a little bit about different kinds of interfaces ways to move in VR. We've not, some are better suited than others depending on the task, right? So if you're having a training simulation, for example, you might not, like a surgery, you might not want people just flying around anywhere they want. But if you're playing a game where you're riding a dragon, for example, for this world, you, maybe you don't want teleportation, maybe you don't want one-to-one -one walking. Right, so it really depends on the task at hand as well. Um, what task do you have people to do and how believable do you want it to be in that environment? And we, we quickly, briefly learned about evaluation, comparison, and how to choose an interface. So um, I wanna tell you all that we are running a study in my lab right now. Um, they can all participate. We're, we're having a, a survey online where we're asking people to tell us about your experience of using VR and how do you move in VR? So we're trying to get collect a bunch of information on how do people move, what do you think about them, what, what can be better, these interfaces. In our lab, we're constantly making new interfaces, we're creating new ones. So it's, we really need people's opinion on what's out there and what can be better. So if you could all help us out and tell your friends, I'd really appreciate it. You can find out more on our, on our website. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you very much for participating. Um, are there any questions? Awesome. Thank you so much. I have learned so many new ways of moving in VR. Damn, that's really cool. <laughs> All right. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. Um, I will now allow hands raised. Oh, I see that's already activated. So on the bottom right of your screen, you see a raise hands button. You can click on that once. And then I see that you have a question and I can give you uh, a megaphone, which means that everybody in the audience can hear you properly. So we already have four questions coming in. The first one is from Neptune Eater. There you go. You can ask your question now. Where are you? Raise your hand. Um, I can't hear you. 
Oh, sorry. Teleport. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> hey. You had a question? No. Oh, all right. You clicked it by accident. That can happen. No Thank problem. you anyway. And no Thank problem. Um, next one is Rob. Ivan, thanks very much. That was a, I'm over here. It was a, an excellent presentation, really interesting. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, your slide and the links to the, your uh, lit search will be available on the Educators of VR website. Um, so, a uh, quick question for you. Um, um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are before the conclusion of your study. Right now, we know there are certain <clears throat> ways to mitigate motion sickness in a, on a social VR platform like this. So. You know, for example, instead of using the joystick, you teleport or you use the joystick, but you have the, the zoom sort of uh, focus uh, and that sort of thing. Where, what mitigation strategies do you think we'll see in the future or, or, or will dominate in the future to, to avoid that conflict between moving physically in, or not moving physically in the world and moving uh, as a, in avatar form? Do you think it'll come in the form of um, sensors on the, the legs and the feet or sitting in a chair with some sort of floor and shoe system? What do you think uh, uh, will sort of dominate in, in that area in the future? Okay, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so actually, it's really hard to understand why we get motion sickness. Um, people are still constantly studying this, which we can't really pinpoint it yet. We're not really sure. We, we have something that we think may cause motion sickness, but we're not really sure. Like, if we add more of this, does it cause it more? If we add less of this, right? So um, maybe a lot of it has to do with um, your, your sensation of movement. So sometimes, mm -hmm. um, which is called vection, what I didn't go into, which is um, if you feel you're moving, especially if you're feeling moving really fast, but then your body isn't, then that's when you get more sick. Uh, that's one of the issues. There can be a lot of other ones as well. Um, but then, of course, like the least you have of your, you thinking that you're moving, um, the least sick you'll get. That's why normally if you teleport, you don't get sick from it. Uh, you already get less because you you really just move from one location to the other. You don't have that in between motion of that speed in between those two positions. So that's really that's a really quick way of doing it. Um, but the problem with that is that you don't really feel you're in that environment. You don't feel that too immersed because it's not really a natural way to move. We don't just teleport in real life yet. But um, so that's one of the issues. So one of the things is normally is having some um, some form of you of your body knowing that you're moving is normally a really good way. So one of the uses for them that I showed is leaning based, which is all you need is your headset. And that's really useful. You, you, like you have to calibrate your initial position, but then just leaning forward and leaning back or leaning to the side um, is really helpful. And we've done some studies where it does show that it did decrease motion sickness compared to joystick compared to other ones. So that's a really easy one that, that anybody can use because all they need is their headset. You don't need any ex additional um, sensors or hardware. So, so that might be one way. Like using your legs, right? Those also um, kind of moving or swinging your arms out even also help as well. But they can get very tiring. So it really depends um, where people want to go. But leaning might be a good solution. So, so are you suggesting uh, just leaning while you're moving with your joystick, or are you suggesting there's a headset that would enable you to move forward if you lean forward? Yeah, inside, um, inside. yeah. The studies we've done is all you need is a headset. Actually, you don't even need the controllers. It's interesting because all, you don't even use your controllers to movement anymore. All you have to do is lean forward. And when you lean back, you can grab things, you can interact with things, shoot, whatever you want to do. But because you're not worrying about your hands to move, your body is taking care of that. And all you need is a headset. Okay. Thanks, for, thanks so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you for your question. Yes, thank you. And it's also a random tip for me. I also get very motion sick in the car and I tend to lean as well when uh, I go around the corner. That helps as well against motion sickness in cars. <laughs> yeah, just to add really up on fun. that actually, um, when you're in the car, if you notice that if you're a passenger, you might get more sick than if you're a driver. Because when you're driving, you have more control of where you're going. So because of that, you're, there are more things in your body. It's like, I know where I'm going because I just changed the wheel. I just turned, right? So I'm controlling it. But if you're a passenger, um, you, you won't have that much control. So your body might feel you get sick. I get sick always on the bus in the car and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. All right, uh, next question is from Michael. 
Hello. So for the different metrics that you talked about to consider like usability, affordance and performance, how would you like assign different weights to them? Um, there are multiple, um, so performance, for example, is one that you can easily quantify, right? So if your performance is how fast you do a task, then you have it on time. If you have it on, um, you're trying to do, trying to like move through these streets without touching the border. So every time you touch the border, you get, you lose points. Um, if you're trying to go for a world and shooting things and I get shot back at, every time you get shot, you lose points or every time you, um, you're, you can shoot, right? Or you can dodge bullets, for example, you might get, so all those can be used for performance measures, um, for usability and for other ones, it's more of, um, asking the user, it's really important to do user testing. Um, so talking to the person after they've done the study and then asking them like, which one did you, so it's more like a, 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 asking them, which one did you feel was easier to use? Or just evaluating them, right? How easily can they do something? Do they feel like they're struggling while you're observing them? Uh, and you, there are a lot of these more like HCI questions. You can, which you get up through a lot of inter interview questions with the users. All right. Thank hope that you, answers your question. question. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. Another question from KMC. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, uh, I can see that I'm unmuted. Great. Um, thank you a lot for the presentation. First of all, it was a very, very interesting one. I'm uh, a robotics engineer myself. Uh, although it's not really part of like my my uh, my field, I have heard of research people have performed with exoskeletons or like prosthetic arms or external arms that they actually control with like nerve endings or brain waves. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if they like, you know, if the VR researchers are already looking into that, actually controlling your avatar with a uh, with brain waves actually. Maybe it's a bit yeah. too Oh sorry. Did you say anything else? No, no, no. So like kind of the question if you knew of any research done in that area. Okay. Yeah. There actually is some research. Um so I didn't go into it, but there is there are some sort of like BCIs, right? So brain computer brain computer interfaces. There are a lot of research where you where they would first um, do some training, some calibration. So you have to think about maybe like an op an object moving forward, moving up, down, left, right, right. You calibrate all that through your EEG signals, and then you would then ha use that to move in, in in VR. So that has been used and used a lot in, in for robotics as well. Um, so that is being used. One of the issues though is because. Normally, to do EEG and some other um, sensors, it's normally on your on your on your on top of your head, right on your scalp, um, that aren't invasive. You they, they normally are positioned the same in the, close to where your headset is. So there is some interference, some noise because of the of the electricity and everything through the headset, and because of mm -hmm. where the headset is positioned, it might hurt your face, right? Because you have a sensor and you have another headset on top of that sensor, kind of pushing into your head. Um, but there are some um, new headsets, some headsets are coming out. Where they have um, all the physical the sensors inside, like inside the headset itself. Like there are new ones coming out, and maybe next few years, um, where there are a lot of sensors for eye tracking for other things, and there are EEG as well. So there are some studies with that, but it is difficult because um, when you're in VR, there's so much going on in your world. There's so many things moving, right? So many environments that your brain is constantly focusing on so many things. It's really hard to focus on controlling yourself or controlling like a movement with all of that distracting at the same time. So it's hard to focus because it's so much information at once. That's one of the issues. Um, but people are studying it. So especially for um, accessibility reasons, if you cannot use a controller, for example, or if you cannot physically move, there are some other ways of getting around that. And one of the ways is using EEG and some other signals to help you. So there are studies, of course. All right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. Interesting question and interesting answer as well. Thanks. All right, another question from Paris Childs. Oh, that's Paris Chilton. Oh, like, Chilton. Like, yeah, like <laughs> Hilton. I'm taking my All right, what's back. your question? I have a two-part question. Well, well, first of all, one is, I don't know if everybody's figured this out yet, but Oculus now allows you to turn your brightness down all the way, and it completely changes alt space for the better. Because it, I didn't realize how harsh the alt space lighting was, till I turned down the Oculus all the way down, and now it's at zero. 
and it makes a completely different experience. That's one thing. My question though is maybe, I have developed a massive sty infection on my right eye. I've never had an infection like this. I started doing uh, the Oculus a couple of months ago. I Google it and it doesn't really show anything, but do, do you know anything about eye infections? Because I attribute this to the Oculus. I just can't believe that I just coincidentally started, you know, the worst eye infection I've ever had at the same time I picked up the Oculus. Thanks for your question, but we are talking here about VR locomotion. So basically oh. how you can move in VR. Oh, okay. so I, I'm not I'm afraid we don't have that answer for you, but you can always contact uh, Altspace and ask them about yeah. it. No, okay, thank you. Yeah, and for that, I wish you the best with your eye infection. That might help you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would do that. Hope you get better. All right. Uh, next question is from Not Astro. Where are you? How am I willing to do hard? No. All right. No, thank you. Okay, next question from Rick. Yeah, um, there's a couple I was going to comment. Uh, first of all, there is a, a study, I believe, out of Iowa State where they um, validated uh, or did some research on whether foot movement would affect um, BR sickness and, and using your feet to navigate. Uh, they found that it did help. Um, but I have a couple questions. One is, um, I'm very interested. I think they've sold two to three million uh, quests now, quest twos, mm -hmm. um, in the third quarter, fourth quarter of the last year. And I'm wondering, like, I have, I have a new uh, foot operated game controller that I would like to interact with the quest to, but I'm not sure how, how to get it. Um, most of the games don't take just any random input or even game gamepad input. So I'm just yeah. curious how to do that. And maybe that sort of leads to my other question. Um, given that I have a new controller, um, it's actually, in, it was inspired by the hoverboard. So it actually mm -hmm. gives you a combination of, of movements and we've added strafing as well. So we prototyped that. I'm looking for maybe uh, a way to get into a study that would evaluate uh, this and, and especially tied into a rotating chair. So I didn't see you mention Ro Roto VR or anybody like that, but I see the potential of having the, my device, uh, Hobo Loco, used in conjunction with a rotating chair. So the vestibular, at least you get the vestibular ro rotation aspect. Uh, you wouldn't get the inertial aspect with the ro roto VR chair or, or a rotating chair. But anyway, I'm I'm kind of curious. I guess first of all, whether anybody is successfully uh, connected with a Quest Two for may or maybe suggest a game that I can use that could take keyboard, mouse, gamepad input um, over Bluetooth. And then the second was the, the, the studies. And if you are interested in contacting me, you can use my uh, uh, hobolocal.com website. Yeah, um, sure. So um, concerning movement with your feet, I, did, I talked about the 3D rudder, which is right, so you kind of move your feet around and you, put, you rotate. Um, and then we've done studies in the lab where we have like a Wii platform. And under that, we had a separate, separate platform. And then based on your, your, your feet movement on that platform, you can also direct where you're moving. What you're saying is really, it sounds really interesting though, because one of the issues with these controllers is if you're on a swivel chair and you, um, you physically move, you rotate your chair, if your device was flat on the ground, like the, like the rudder, for example, um, then it, uh, it won't follow you as you rotate your chair. Right. So that, um, so that what you talk about, it seems really interesting. I'm curious to learn more. We can talk about that afterwards. Um, um, the first thing you talked about is how to integrate it. Uh, I know for Steam VR, you're, you're able to create plugins and like for with API, and you can create that uh, with like DLLs, for example, and that will be integrated on top of um, other other games. So you you kind of mimic you you take your your input that really becomes like a joystick, and you would actually offload it to your uh, to your API. So you kind of feed it from your API, which you get from your sensor of your device, and it would be brought into it as if it was a joystick. So if you're looking into that, you might be able to get something. Um, I haven't looked too much mm -hmm. about the, um, the Oculus Quest. I believe there probably is some tool for developers because people do create, for example, 
I believe the it's either the rudder or a different one recently got onto the quest as well. There, there, people are creating it. So if they they've, they've done it, um, there probably is a way of doing it. I've yet to look more into. I'm not sure. Uh, I know about Steam VR. And then what you can do is, um, before if you can't get it yet to to communicate with um, Oculus, what you can do is maybe just try to communicate with um, connecting the Oculus to the control to the computer and using it through that way. And then see if it works. If everything works, then it'll probably work if you do communication direct to, to the, the Quest. Um, but you might have to talk, contact them and see what the, how to develop for that. Um, and then in, in regard to the study, um, what you can always do is contact, like for example, myself or some other researchers, and then you could um, talk to them about your device. And if they might be interested in it, and then if you could, normally what happens is sometimes um, people really are looking to study, right? What's the result of, the performance, right? Well, the things that I talked about with one device and another. So it could be kind of incorporated in that study. Well, we would um, compare multiple devices and then mm -hmm. see the results from the study. But the best way is just uh, reach out to some researchers that, that do research in this field, like myself, for example, and some other ones. And then just tell them about your interface, tell them what you think, why, why it might be interesting. And if they feel it's interesting, you can, maybe you can, get it, um, you can ship it to them and they can use it in a future study. Uh, the only Great. thing about Thank that you. is um, it's really hard to guarantee some results because right, we're comparing to different ones. Mm -hmm. So the results might be favorable and might not be favorable. You have to take that mm -hmm. in consideration as well. Thank you. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Yes, thanks. Um, I see, Rob, you also have another question. I think you can just unmute yourself and then you will be there. Let's try it. No. All right, let me help you. All right, there you go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, not a not a question, more more a comment, Ivan. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the uh, Immersive Learning Research Network? I'm not sure. Um, okay. I might have heard of it. Um, okay, well, if, if you're not, um, they have a conference coming up in, uh, I think it's April, May. And mm -hmm. it'd be really great to hear your presentation given at uh, the Immersive Learning Research Network. So if you get a chance to take a look at their site, it's a really good group of um, educators from around the globe who are doing research in immersive learning. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll look into that. It sounds like a, a good, great place as well to talk, help people learn as well. Yes, for sure. Thank you. All right, then I have final question. <laughs> I'm really curious about your opinion um, about um, immersion and these uh, types of VR locomotion. Do, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Is there been research about which ways uh, are most immersive, et cetera? Sure. Um, yeah, so normally the, the, the more immersive one is the one that you really feel like you're in that body, right? You feel like you're in that avatar, you feel like you're in that world. And the one that... that, that Normally, the um, the active motions and the one that are um, continuous are the more uh, immersive ones. So you feel like you have control over your body. You feel like control over how you move. You're in that world. But then it's really important to tie how you move to the experience, right? So if you're, like I said, if you're flying on a dragon, you don't want teleportation. You don't want one-to-one -one movement. So it really depends um, what you're trying to do in that world, who you are, what your task is. It's really all really important around it. Um, if you're just, let's go like a basic example. You just walking around an environment, you have to go up hills and down hills and go for all these things. One of the best ways is leaning, because um, right, you don't need a lot of additional um, hardware and your, your body is feeling like you're moving forward. You, could you lean in the direction or some platform like on your feet, for example, right? It's all really useful because you, your body feels like you're in that, you're moving in that way and your, your eyes, your other senses are also feeling you're moving in that way. So you feel a bit more embodied in that because everything's kind of connecting. Your senses, your senses are connecting. The way you move makes sense. It makes sense with your task. So um, leaning base, um, walking. Actually, the best one is walking. Um, that's um, a given. Uh, but then leaning base would be kind of right, right behind it. Uh, so like the one that we did a study of the standing leaning base one, that one almost gave you like the performance is really close to actually walking, which is really interesting. Um, so those one might be good places to kind of look at. Um, teleportation is useful, but it's, it's actually the one that takes you the, the farthest away from um, immersion. 
because we don't really move as we teleport in real world life. So it's a really big disconnect of that. And it also um, inhibits a lot of things in games. So for example, if you're playing a game where people are kind of attacking you, or shooting at you, if you can just teleport, you're kind of like, if you don't really think around that, you're kind of like cheating because they're about to hit you, but then you move to like a totally different location, which you normally can't do in real world life. So you have to really think about if you're developing, um, what limitations are you giving to your users so that it kind of makes sense, even if they, even if they, do, they can teleport, they can use these things. Um, what limitations make sense for the game? It's where it's fair for everybody and it's where it's still immersive. So yeah, leaning and walking is probably the best. Um, we have so far with the least amount of sensor, least amount of hardware. So affordable and awesome. available for everybody. All right, cool. Thanks. Um, yeah. Well, one thing that comes to mind. So, uh, for example, I um, uh, design VR training for vocational education, and leaning sounds indeed really interesting. But uh, it often happens that people lean in a little bit to check out an object. For example, I do that this mm -hmm. as well when I game. Is there a yeah. solution for that? Um, so normally, um, so the one that I showed as well, there there was uh, like a, this. An, uh, this cylinder around you, and then in that space, it's one to one. So if you lean a tiny bit, you're still only mo you're not moving yet. Um, once you go past a threshold, so once you go past like a, a really big lean or big step, then you then um, do the leaning motion. So there is some like some variations. There are also ways where you can like have a button press for them to so, like enable disable that locomotion. So if you press it, um, if you lean, you go or you whatever you're performing, then you move. If you um, disable it, then you're back to one-to-one. -to -one. So also mixing the different kinds of locomotion can also help. The only downside is that the user needs to remember and understand how to turn things off, how to turn things on. And if it doesn't work well, they get frustrated. Um, so that's one thing you have to think about. Right? So if you combine multiple types, it's useful, but they, it's, it can be taxing on the user. Um, and then normally if you're doing yeah, training yeah. Sim or simulations, you literally want to try to get it um, as close to one to one as possible, because it makes sense when they go in the real world to be able to really take what they've done in the virtual world and bring it to the real world, right? So the more um, connectedness there is between the virtual and the real, the more they can apply their knowledge and the training can be useful in the real world. But the least it is, um, it's really difficult for them to really understand because like, oh, in VR, I just teleported, but now I have to walk. In VR, I just like threw something and it stuck somewhere, but in the real world, it won't work. So it's really important that, especially for training, that it, that's, it's as close as possible to the real world. And if you want people to really move around in the world, like one way it's kind of cheating is by using elevators or by using stairs. Um, so you walk a little bit, you go into an elevator, you go to the new floor and it's all new. And you can still, you're still walking on the same environment as you were before, but it's a new location because you're meant, you're, in your mind, well, I went, in, I went into an elevator. I'm in a new location now, so it's fine. Um, even though I'm walking the same place I just walked before. So there are a lot of tricks you can do as well. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey. And uh, considering the time, uh, I would uh, like to thank you so much for this super interesting presentation. Let's give Ivan a hand, you all. Thank you all like Yeah, thank you, everybody. If you have any yeah, questions, awesome. you can always reach out to me as well. Yeah. And also for the ones who just came in, we recorded this uh, presentation and it will be visible on the Educators in VR YouTube uh, page. So you can just uh, search for Educators in VR on YouTube and you will definitely find this presentation back somewhere tomorrow or the day after. Um, yeah, and furthermore, uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, we hope Ivan comes back and presents his results because we are super curious. <laughs> yeah, hopefully <laughs> of course. Help everybody. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And also don't forget to look at his study and maybe participate as well. Uh, the link can be found um, also in the description of this event and in our newsletter. And we will post it on the Discord as well. And uh, over here on this wall, you can find everything you need to find your researchers back and the link to the study to Ivan, etc. So feel free to screen capture that, make a picture of that if you want. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will um, unmute everyone and um, I'm not sure if Ivan has some time left, but at least you have two minutes <laughs> uh, yeah, to uh, talk. Yeah. Any questions, let me know. Get on stage. Yes.